Charlie, it's yours. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Rana Akhar. Rana, please tell us about your living history. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for the introduction. And thanks to you and Sri and the rest of the organizers for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm currently an assistant professor in the physics department at Virginia Tech. I'm, I'm going to start my talk by telling you a little bit about me as a person before delving into my scientific journey. Uh, so I was actually born in a very small village in Lebanon uh, during a very tough time. It was the civil war in Lebanon. Um, I'm the eldest of three children, uh, and I'm the uh, first and only person in my extended family to have uh, received a PhD. Uh, my parents uh, both did not go to college, but they actually made sure to provide us with the best school education that they could afford. This meant that I and my siblings had to make my, our way to college through various means. Uh, I actually had scholarships, I tutored, I taught. Um, and a fun fact, I was actually a high school teacher of physics for one year before I started my PhD here in the US. I am married, my spouse, spouse and I actually enjoy a variety of activities, including traveling, cooking, food tasting, and hiking. And I have some pictures for you here to, from our various journeys. I also enjoy gardening and painting and photography. These are some of my uh, food outcomes, cooking outcomes, and my gardening outcomes. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how this started. Uh, my fascination with science actually started at a very early age. Um, but there was a defining moment in my life that kind of shaped my interest in higher STEM education and wanting to receive a PhD. And that is when uh, I got hold of a very scarce copy of uh, Scientific American as, uh, as a kid. Um, this is what it is. In Arabic, it actually really translates as science in the world. And I remembered that that issue had an article on a Mars mission that was led by Charles al Ashi who's actually a Lebanese-born American scientist. And for a high school student like me, who was living the aftermath of the Civil War, this meant hope. All of a sudden, becoming a scientist became a potentially achievable dream. Um, and I'm emphasizing this because having a role model makes a world of difference. And this is why this Living History series is such a neat concept in documenting personal histories and uh, providing examples of role models and possible career trajectories. So I actually realized then that I really wanted to major in physics. And like many other people in this series, I actually really didn't like biology in high school just because of the way it was taught. So I went on to get a bachelor's uh, degree in physics from the Lebanese University. This is a university that I could, could afford to pay for from just tutoring and, and side work. Um, and then I was able to get a fully funded scholarship uh, to work on my master's degree at the American University of Beirut. Um, interestingly, I actually started in a very theoretical area of research. So my uh, 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 master's thesis was actually on supersymmetric gauge theories. And this is partly because I was not exposed to other ideas um, or other areas of research. Uh, being in a country that is still getting out of a civil war meant that research opportunities are limited at best, and this was one of the few areas that I knew about. Um, I was fortunate enough, though, to work with uh, Professor Ali Shamsuddin, who was a student of Abdus Salam, who got the 1979 Nobel Prize in Physics with Sheldon Glashow and Steve Weinberg for his contributions to the electro, uh, electroweak unification theory. Um, but I also had another defining moment in my trajectory, and that is that uh, at the end of my master's degree, uh, Professor Malik Tobal, who's a material scientist, offered me this amazing opportunity to work in his lab, growing thin films uh, using pulse laser deposition, and I fell in love with experimental research. Again, getting exposed to new things is really important. So I decided that when I came to the US, flying over the uh, Atlantic, I wanted to uh, do my PhD in experimental high energy theory to kind of follow up on the work that I did during my master's degree. And in fact, my first year in graduate school, I worked on, a, on an experiment that is focused on neutron beta decay, and I absolutely hated it. Um, and part of it is that uh, I realized then that one of my weaknesses is that I do not have enough patience to wait for my experiments for 10 or 15 years to see results. So I always tell my students, it is really important to realize your strengths, but it's also important to realize your weaknesses. Um, so I realized then that my interests were still in material research, so I switched to condensed matter physics, and this is uh, uh, during my PhD at Indiana University. 
Uh, at that time, I was actually fortunate to um, get the opportunity to work with Roger Penn, who had just moved to Indiana uh, after a long career as a director of the Los Alamos Neutron Scattering Center. Uh, in my work with Roger, we solved a longstanding problem in scattering uh, from ordered systems and ordered materials. I was able to develop a dynamical theory for the analysis of the scattering data that he was getting out of this unique uh, experimental method that he's developed. Um, and uh, so this is where my theoretical background came in handy, even though I was working in an experimental group. And we've since used this theory for a variety of applications, including um, understanding colloidal assembly and confinement, uh, uh, working with thermoresponsive uh, cell growth scaffolds, uh, and even uh, figuring out ways to design and, and uh, uh, characterize tunable nanofluidics. Um, now, my journey continued after PhD uh, during my postdoctoral uh, position and uh, later on a Shell Fellowship that I got at Oak Ridge. Uh, during my postdoc, my first postdoc at NIST, I, my research uh, interests still evolved. I wanted to explore materials research a little bit more, so I joined a project that was working on polymer nanodynamics and hybrid uh, solution structures. But I picked a side project on lipid membrane dynamics on the side, and I really, really liked working with membranes. Um, so towards the end of my first postdoc, I applied to the uh, Schull Fellowship at Oak Ridge National Lab, and I got it. And here's a picture of me with the Nobel Prize of Clifford Scholl. We actually got the 1994 Nobel Prize in Physics with Bertrand Bruckhaus for the development of neutron scattering techniques. Uh, and so there, I was able to work a little bit more on membrane curvature and dynamics trying to understand membrane uh, functions and properties using neutron scattering methods uh, that I was still learning and exploring. Uh, and now in my group, we actually do a variety of uh, research projects at the uh, interface of physics, material science, and engineering. Um, and what I really like about uh, this is that through these interdisciplinary projects that, uh, that we do, we get to collaborate with many amazing scientists at universities, national labs, uh, and the industry. Um, and we do this across different areas of research, uh, following our passion, following what we're really excited about. Um, and in all of this, we actually use a combination of experiments, simulations, and theoretical modeling. So again, nothing goes to waste in science. My theoretical background came in quite handy. In fact, we're one of the leading groups in model development of uh, materials characterization by scattering methods. And we apply this to a variety of systems, including polymeric systems and biological uh, materials. Since this uh, uh, series is primarily focused on biophysics, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the biophysics focus in my lab, which is the major thrust that we currently have. Uh, so in my lab, we're really interested in understanding the dynamic responses of membranes to compositional changes and external cues, uh, whether that is uh, molecular additives, engineered molecules, or even environmental factors that impact membrane functions. Uh, we use that as a proxy to cell membranes, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, we also try to, uh, through various methods, to uh, figure out predictive design rules for the applications of these membranes in artificial cell technologies, uh, technologies and liposomal uh, uh, delivery applications. Um, and another thing that we're really interested in is uh, the dynamic responses of membranes to membrane protein interactions. So right now, we're working on a really, really exciting um, uh, area of uh, biophysics, uh, particularly focused on membrane dynamics. And so we study membranes in actions, and we do that on unexplored scales. And a lot of the techniques or a lot of the uh, projects that we, we use, uh, we study, we actually use uh, neutron scattering methods that access these really remarkable and unique length and time scales. So we measure things on nanometer length scales and nanosecond time scales. And these are uh, um, spatial temporal scales that are, remain not very well understood and remarkably underexplored. And in doing this, we've been able to solve decade-long dilemmas in, for example, the effects of cholesterol on membrane elasticity, uh, using engineered molecules to uh, develop and to uh, uh, um, define uh, scaling laws that uh, membranes uh, exhibit uh, on these mesoscopic scales, and also to discover uh, the unified laws that govern membrane mechanics uh, on, on scales that have not been understood before. And this is really important because these scales that we explore 
uh, happens, they happen to be on the same spatiotemporal scale of uh, protein conformational changes. Uh, so we're now uh, working or using all of this information uh, to understand molecular evolution and adaptation and how membrane dynamics interact or interface with protein dynamics to impart functional regulation that will allow us to understand uh, cell function and membrane functions a lot more. Um, and finally, I would like to conclude uh, by uh, uh, some lessons from my personal journey. I talked uh, earlier about um, uh, role models and how important role models in science are and also in, in exemplifying career progression. And again, this series is really important in emphasizing these aspects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to realize uh, one's personal strengths, but it's also important to realize personal weaknesses. Um, and as the series has been emphasizing throughout, professional and scientific journeys do not need to be linear. Um, and I do encourage students and uh, young scholars everywhere to just follow their passion for research and discovery, uh, because that might lead them to places that they've never thought of before. Um, this also means that uh, it's important for people and the students in particular to get exposed to knowledge and opportunities. And this is why it's very important to have equitable access to information and, not, and uh, opportunities. I also want to end by saying that uh, science can be a lonely experience, especially for someone who is an outsider. So this is where family, friends, allies, and hobbies are important for survival and sanity. Uh, and unfortunately, we're still not in an ideal world. There are lots of stereotypes and uh, various forms of biases that still impact the lives and careers of so many people. So we all need to make sure to speak up and take action. And in fact, this has been something that has inspired my service commitments and uh, my advising philosophy in my group as well. So with this, I'll leave you with a picture, to, a couple of pictures from my own uh, research group, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, uh, thank you, Rana. I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, I'll start with a question from uh, the audience. Um, what made you switch from hard condensed matter to high energy and then to soft matter? Um, so I actually started in high energy physics and then slowly went to condensed matter physics and then soft matter physics. So it, it hasn't been a back and forth journey. It's been a, a unidirectional journey, but in, un, in an unconventional way. Yeah, okay. Okay, and then another question. Um, can you share with us some of the community service work that you do and why you find doing it to be a valuable use of your time? Thank you for this question. Um, so I am on a bunch of committees. Um, I um, also started some committees. Um, so when I was a fellow at Oak Ridge National Lab, I actually started the Women in Neutron Science Group, which is still a very active group, which makes me very, very proud. Um, because I realized then that uh, I mean, women in physics are still a very, very small minority. Um, women in national labs are an even smaller minority. Um, and there are so many challenges that face them. And um, particularly when it comes to younger scholars like postdocs. So this initiative of starting this uh, uh, group was really important to empower uh, women and marginalized groups in neutron sciences um, to get professional development that they need, to get the support that they need, and so on and so forth. Uh, currently, I'm serving as the uh, uh, chair of the APS Committee on the Status of Women in Physics. This is a committee that is dear to my heart, and it does amazing things in terms of empowering women and marginalized groups in physics through various programs, including uh, the APS Climate Site Visit Program, uh, certain uh, awards and fellowships that are um, that mean to empower uh, young women or women who had career interruptions. Um, and so these are things that are I'm really excited and I'm really I really care deeply about. I've also had other services on other APS committees and other um, um, scientific uh, communities, um, but these are highlights of what I've done so far. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, one other question from the chat. Um, could you share some of the unusual challenges of being an immigrant scientist, the, the first in your family to get a PhD? There are so many challenges that come with that, um, partly um, stereotypes and role models, um, the lonely experience, uh, feeling that sometimes you don't belong. 
Um, and it's not just a self-imposed um, feeling. It's also there's a lot of marginalization that comes from the community, which unfortunately is still far from ideal. Um, there's also additional stresses and pressures that uh, immigrant students face. Um, including uncertainties of career paths, including um, uncertainties of immigration statuses and so on and so forth. Um, so these are serious issues that create unnecessary stresses and additional pressures that other um, uh, students or scholars might not experience. Thank you. Thank you again for a wonderful talk and for, for those answers. Thanks.